Heart Beat Alaska. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heart Beat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you by Donlin Gold, developing a mining project that can help enrich the lives of residents in the Yukon Kuskokwim region by providing opportunities for families to live in safe, healthy, and prosperous communities. From Air Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska, we know the territory. And by Alaska Commercial Company, with stores located throughout rural Alaska. A proud sponsor of Heartbeat Alaska. Tan across Alaska in July. It's hot. There's a breeze in the air, but that's hot too. Today, this community of around 200 people aren't just sitting around and enjoying themselves. They're busy. You could feel it in the air and hear it everywhere. All this is for um, my brother-in-law, Jerry. He's making potlatch on his wife and his son and his kids and all the boys went out and got the meat. And what we do is we, we help him. We all help each other. In this village, we all get together and do it together. Tanacross is located on the Alaska road system near Tope. It's a short drive from the highway and sits on the banks of the Tanana River. Where are they going to land? Go down here and turn left and follow the road to the left and you'll see the river bank. Tanacross people had originated from Dissad. Dissad is an old village about five miles north of Tanakra. After Dissad, they moved to the present day Mansfield village. Then came another move from Mansfield to what is known as Tanana Crossing. Tanana Crossing is sometimes referred to as the old village by some of the residents. In 1930, 32, somewhere around there, the, the BIA built a school. So that pretty much dictated that the people, you know, start living in the village for the school and the church. You had mandatory attendance for the youth to attend school. We lived on the north side of the river until 1974, fall time, was when we moved over here. At the time the village was growing, and the move made sense. We didn't have no running water, no electricity, no uh, refrigerator. Uh, state give land over there because high school kids too dangerous. To then, go across the yeah, river. They wouldn't give us no housing because it's too low. So they give us land over there. Up until '74, you know, a majority of our lifestyle over there in the old village of Tana Cross was subsistence lifestyle. Once we moved over here, you know, we had electricity, we had fuel oil, um, water and sewer. So that dictated a modification in your lifestyle to the extent where you had to go to work and, and work with work search and working for cash, uh, you know, cash economy more so intensive and required. And then along with that came more stricter fish and wildlife regulations. And they don't do Sam like this. This is 
everything is just uh, coming out that's a new way they do. I'm learning from uh, the other people today about our way of living. You know, the other words are I, uh, I have to learn how to eat different food because of the law. The law was here. Uh, uh, animals over there and I'm over here. I can't get to the animal because of the law here today. I feel, I feel today like I am been looking down at it all the time. People are looking down at me all the time. The old ways are alive and well even today. Emma Northway turned 97 in 2012. She's one of the original born in the village of Mansfield. Long time ago, I was in the village of Mansfield. I was in the village of Mansfield. Walk. That, uh, footwork. Trail. Yeah. And they don't do same like this. This is everything. It's just uh, coming out. It's a new way they do. Not like old time. Yeah. Different. Young people in there just uh, buy stores and they buy everything. It's easy to do. Yeah. Long time ago, they don't even make padlas like that. Not very much thing, just sewing stuff, lots of mugs and oh. gloves, hat, and just few blankets. My mother told me, few blankets. I don't know where they get the blanket. They cut half and half. And the one who did call, they gave it to them. Oh. Yeah. Hard way they go by. Not like this, and uh, not, not very much white man food. And we're very rich in our culture. And uh, we have our own village called Culture Camp. In which we operate in the summertime, around July, June and July. We teach our young young kids our tradition way. In other words, we uh, just blaze a trail for the young people today, you know. Today's potlatches are generally big events. Athabascan leader Jerry Isaac came back to his home village to honor two of his loved ones who passed on, son Damien and wife Arlene Demet Isaac. They're expecting hundreds to attend. Supplies from across the river are hauled in and everyone in the village pulls their weight. Like Diane said last night, make sure you open your house and welcome the people. And uh, do your best to uh, help in any way you can. When they do uh, a Moya potlatch and stuff like that, uh, all the other uh, people that are related like uh, the uh, friend Jerry is having one on his wife's side. Jerry Isaac is considered a high-ranking leader, and tribal chiefs, relatives, and friends begin to gather. Well, G Jerry, Jerry was making a potlatch. He's, uh, he was married into our, our family. So when he decided to make potlatch, and Brittany's a relative of mine too, so we're, we're donating all this to Jerry so that he can have plenty food to feed his friends when they show up for the potlatch. That's what we're trying to do, help him out, so. This, this started back in March. We started saving for him. So you can see there's frozen ones, there's half dry ones, and there's dry ones, and ducks and white fish. We got him plenty of food to help him out, so we're very honored to be helping him. And then that's the meat. After the kill, we hang it up. And then a day or two, we hang it up, smoke it, give it a little smoke flavor, and then, uh, even the moose fat, we hang it up, and then they, we cut up the bones, and then the arms and the legs we use for fry. 
It's the briskets, that's the rump, and that's um, the ribs. This one here is the rib. That's the rib right there. And then this one here is the brisket. This one here is the rump. And then the arms and legs are back there. This is um, half dry fish that we got from Massfield. Me and my kids cut it up and we um, smoke dry it in here. This is whitefish. Wow. We um, smoked it for about three, four days. Uh -huh. And then uh, cook it for old people. If they like it like this. You boil it. Boil it with um, potatoes, rice, you know, mm -hmm. onions. and Some of them they eat it just like this. They just peel it off and eat it just like this. Mm. Mm, good. Everything and anything we get off the land, we hang it in here. Wow. And then after that, we preserve it, cut it up, put it away. We have meat all winter long. We take the heart, slice it up, put it aside, and then cook it for the visitors that come in. Soup. Soup and meat. Fat. Those things that's so... And that they don't do like right now. No store, nothing. My mom tell me a story about like that. Uh, nothing, no, no store, nothing. What great while they go to Eagle, the Dawson, with footwork. Oh. Take them long time to come and back. When they quell, quell those affair, they're that kind, they take it down they No dog team. They got, uh, they use those uh, moose leg skin. They make it uh, just like, I don't know, just just the, the way they put it together and top is open. They tie up, they put the fur inside and they oh, put it yeah. like mm -hmm, that and mm -hmm. they go. Mm -hmm. Just like that. What about your house when you were little? What did it look like? Tishi in terre. I Lock house. I'm not a bonny old town. <laughs> Close by though. But I born inside at the cabin, you know, Massfield. Mansfield. What, what did the old time have? Whatever I tell you, I just hear my mother and they tell story. What Can you remember any stories, Emma? No, no. Not that much. As I run around too much, so I didn't even... Okay. Family is... Uh, we're t close knit family. Everybody is close, one way or another. Um, whether if we're not related or not, then we always try to support each other. Somebody needs to pick up that caribou meat at dawn. The whole village is behind him. He used to be the tribal admin here for this village for years ago. And then he's the TCC president. So a lot of people have a respect for him and his kids. And he did go through a lot of loss. You know, he lost his mom, his father-in-law, his son and his wife and his other brother-in-law, pretty much in close, close time. And they just all pulled behind him to give him the support. Uh, not only for the potlatch, but even for his position he is in TCC. Jerry's son died several years ago and his wife two years ago. She died of lung cancer from smoking. Many others in Jerry's family died of tobacco-related cancer as well. We found that my late father-in-law uh, developed cancer from uh, that's cigarette smoking related. It started in his lungs and it spread from there. He suffered almost two years and he finally succumbed to the, to the cancer uh, in April. One month after I got elected to TCC, uh, to TCC as the president of TCC, 
that was in uh, March 06, I was elected president. And it's, it's strange how uh, within eight months my whole life changed. Well, I was uh, elected president of TCC in March 06, knowing that my father-in-law was sick with cancer. And uh, after I got elected, I came home a couple of times, at which times uh, he was sick, but very uh, proud that I got elected to a regional position. And March, April 21, he passed away, a little, a little over a month after I became president. In July, my mother suddenly got a uh, stroke and she became near invalid. Ten days after that, we found my wife was diagnosed with uh, uh, suspicious mass in her lungs. A few days after that, about a week to ten days after that, they sent um, a biopsy and it was confirmed that they had, uh, she had lung cancer. And uh, it was pretty devastating because we looked forward to life in Fairbanks, my serving as president of TCC, which is a regional uh, nonprofit organization, and life was good. Uh, as president of TCC, Jerry oversaw a huge nonprofit, including a program to help others stop smoking. We travel up the highway to Dot Lake, home to 57-year-old Jacob Luke. It feels good to ride, you know? <laughs> Jacob quit smoking very recently, and for him it's not a casual decision. It's a matter of life and death. Uh, I've been smoking cigarette for uh, 43 years. A friend gently suggested that maybe it was time to quit. He said, I don't mean to tell you what to do, but it's your life, you know, you do whatever you want to do. Well, I say, you know, I'll give it some thought. Jacob Luke is a patient who has tried to quit several times in the past. Um, he's gone up and down with his desires to quit and, and want to stay quit and um, has been through the program a couple of times. Jacob called Tanana Chiefs Conference in Fairbanks and made an appointment with their tobacco okay. cessation program. And six weeks ago, he was introduced to me by our nutritionist, and that's how he was referred to the program. And um, he was in the process of making some major changes with his health, you know, improving. He's got um, some other health issues going on, and he was trying to get those under control. And part of that plan was to quit smoking. I have a diabetic type 2, uh, in between type 2 and 3, and uh, it has something to do with my uh, blood, and I was breathing heavy, and I was heavyweight, uh, I was doing a lot of walking lately, I don't know, I lose about almost 30 some pounds maybe. Wow. My, my average weight was almost 350. It's a huge reward for me to know that they have bettered their life or improved their life, or it's good to hear that they can see, um, taste things better, smell things better, that they can walk that extra mile without feeling so short of breath. And you know, for some patients, just getting up in the morning is a huge process for them because they get short of breath. So someone who's been quit for a week knowing that they can just get up and do their morning routine without feeling like they've run a marathon. It took 42 years for Jacob to stop smoking. It's reinforced though by family members who also made that decision. Hi, I'm Daniel Rice, 26 years old, Dot Lake, Alaska. I have two children, a five-year-old son and an 18-month-old daughter. I quit smoking tobacco November 9th of 2007 for my daughter's sake. I love my kids and it gave me something worth living for. My Uncle Jake is doing a good job. I'm proud of him and the sooner he quits, the longer he can be here with us. Back in town across the potlatch is on the move.
say Jerry himself doesn't smoke, though he has a history of starting and stopping. Once I transferred to Shamal Indian School, I started to smoke because, you know, hair pressure. A lot of uh, kids, kids smoke and well, it looked good to do it, you know. And uh, I always thought I'd, by will, I'd quit sooner or later, but I never did. I started smoking when I was 18 years old and I quit two years ago. The honoring of Jerry's loved ones brought hundreds to the potlatch. Some were smokers. Uh, well, what started me off is I went to Fairbanks to help my aunt with her father-in-law's funeral. And you know, being busy and stressed, that's what got me going again. <laughs> the number one reason is stress. Um, it's a way to cope with, with stress. Tobacco is so powerful. It um, makes the person feel calm and like they can deal with the situation at hand. Tell him I'll call him back in a minute. Um, Jerry will call you back in here in a little bit. Open the, okay. open. the potlatch was the end of the morning, the beginning of healing. The whole village of Tanacross was affected by Jerry's loss of family. Now, he emphasized it was time to heal. Saturday was the day for the whole village to unite in their grief. Each wrote a note to Damien and Arlene or to a lost loved one and sent it up to them. What? We all learn from one another. Jerry is hoping that others will learn that tobacco kills. It may take away your most loved and maybe even your own life. One day in the morning, we're, we start out our day with a prayer and, and uh, after I had coffee and of course had my cigarette at that time. Um, she called me to her bedside and she, and she was telling me stuff I was ignoring. I didn't want to admit that death was imminent. And she grabbed my hand and she says, uh, Jerry, I'm going to die, you know that. And I, I didn't know what to say other than um, I try not to think of it. And she started crying and she says, I can't help you from here on. You're on your own. And you have to watch our children. I don't care what you do. Don't abandon our children. And don't quit what you're doing. Through the darkness, Jerry sees the light. And he's determined to fight even harder for his people and his village. No more should we sit here and wonder how we're going to survive and worry about who's going to help us. We can help ourselves. Use the basic tools right now, coordinate a long-range plan, and move towards it. And you need commitment. You need believers. You need followers. It's, a, it's an extremely viable alternative than to sit here and watch our village grow into extinction. As long as I live, I will not allow that to happen with my village. My dictates from my people and my forebears is to, as a leader, do anything and everything to cause the perpetuity of this community. That's a big task.
Part 3 to Alaska. Hi everybody. Hi, I'm Janie Green. Nice to see you again. On today's program, we travel to Southeast Alaska and visit with the local people there. The Tide Books at are going to tell me when the herring are going to spawn and, and watch those tides and keep track of the seagulls and the eagles and, and the sea lion when I'm out there looking because they're your biggest tattletales of what's happening out there. <laughs> Glenn Howard and his people are part of a story that began long ago. It's a story about the gathering of herring eggs, a tradition that is rich with history. Join me next week when we visit with him and others. Here on KYES-TV, Channel 5, I'm Jeannie Green. See you then. <laughs>